Hello, my name is Rich Howard, owner of Architectural Builder Supply, and this video is to bring you a closer look at the fundamental uh, aspect of keying and master keying uh, a cylinder. Master keying a cylinder is a term used uh, very loosely by a lot of people that um, may, not, may not know properly what it's defined as, and it, I, in my opinion it really doesn't matter how it's used. But the bottom line is this, when someone says they want it master keyed, they're probably meaning to intend they want something beyond just a standard level of keying. So let's discuss some keying uh, aspects. And in this video, I'm going to uh, uh, define and discuss keying and master keying loosely. I'm going to give an example of keying a couple of cylinders to both a standard, what we'll call a change key, just a standard key, and then keying it at the same, the same cylinder to a master key as well and giving an example of, of where that would be applied. Um, what won't be really discussed in this video is, is any fine points of, of locksmithing uh, that's really outside of the context of this video, which is going to focus on the concept of keying and master keying uh, and just a graphical visual example of, of when and how that could be done. So, uh, bottom line is this, master keying is uh, different than just standard keying uh, in this way. Let's say that you had a home. You'll have your front door, your back door, and your garage door. Okay, just standard home. All three of those doors are going to be keyed alike. Each door will have a lock and a deadbolt. Each door is going to be keyed alike, and all three doors will have the same key. They're all going to be keyed alike. So that the homeowner has just one key to go, and he can pass his front door, he can go through his back door, and he can go into his garage. Okay? That's just keying locks alike. Let's take the same example to another house. It's identical. Front door, back door, garage. All keyed alike. They're all just the same key. The owner can go through all three doors using only one key. Two separate houses. Let's say they're a block away from each other. Now let's change the scenario and say that there is a landlord who owns both houses and they're rentals. The, the family in home A has their key. It's going to work all their doors. The family in home B will have their key. It'll work all doors. And let's just assume that those two houses are going to be different keys. That would be normal. However, the landlord He'll want to have just one key that will pass both house A and house B. And let's say in this example, the landlord owns 15 houses or three flats or 15 different properties. He wants just one key so that he can access wherever he needs to go without having to worry about uh, what key he needs to pass which property he owns for whatever reason. So that's an example of Master King, a very basic example of Master King. Uh, Another very standard uh, example of master keying is in a commercial setting. Let's say a small wholesale sort of operation, commercial building, front door, back door, interior office doors. You've got five office doors, let's say, five salesmen. Those doors will be keyed. Each salesman gets his own key for his own door because one is payroll, one is human resources, you know, one is, one is indeed sales, one is you know, uh, whatever, the guy who keeps the recipe to the secret sauce. Different keys. Human resources shouldn't go to the, you know, guy who holds the sales uh, figures. Uh, nobody should be able to go to payroll, that kind of thing. Different keys. However, the guy who owns the business, he can go everywhere. He's going to have just one key, the master key. Front door, back door, then those five keyed locks. That's, a, that's another very common example of master keying and how it applies. The levels of keying don't, in my opinion, don't get more complicated than that. They, they get, uh, they can have additional levels of definition applied to them, but they don't conceptually get more difficult than what I just said. There is a link above this video to a publication by Yale that I have referred to and reread, read and reread dozens of times over the years. Uh, that does a fantastic job, the best in, that I have found, uh, to, to just describe and define in words and uh, graphically the, con the, 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 the construct of keying. It's very simple uh, when, when you've read through this. And the couple pages that are here, and I'm looking at it now, there's really just three pages. Now there's four, but the, the introduction page I think is a bit too definition heavy. 
Um, starting on page two is really, you know, take out of, of this idea, this, this discussion, the, the, the home, just front door, back door, garage. That, those are just key to life. Forget talking about that. We're really talking about how master keys uh, relate. Page of this, of the link above this video, there's going to be four pages. There are four pages in that link. The first page has a page number of 28 on it because I've not linked the entire publication from Yale because it, the, the, the remainder of the publication doesn't apply specifically to this. But the first page is, 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 is more, I think, for the distributor in terms of how he'll go about helping design a key system. However, the second page of that link is, is exactly uh, the definitions uh, required. And by all means, refer to that. I'm not going to go through it because it's, it, the third page is really outside of the scope of what we're talking about. The fourth page helps. Read through it, questions, ask, but I'll get back to this example. So in the example that I've got where I'm going to key two locks right now in succession are a client of mine who we have provided him a replacement door system for the back of his business. It's replacing one that was damaged by a fork truck. New doors, new frame, new lock sets. Everything was damaged. He has a master key that works the entire building. He also has the key for the back door, the doors that were destroyed by the fork truck driver. He doesn't want to have to hand out new keys for his employees that can go out in the loading dock door, so he has asked me to provide the two new locks, which are a lock, and this is the cylinder from the lock. I've, I've disassembled it, that's a different discussion. And then a deadbolt cylinder. I've partially disassembled this as well. Lock and deadbolt. Uh, key to the existing keys. Very common thing to do. So, great, no problem. We make sure that the key system that he has is compatible with the, uh, the locks that we're providing. That's no problem. I've got the locks, I've got the keys, I'm ready to do it. Here we go. So I've got these two mystery keys. Well, I know they're not mystery. I know that this one that's marked master, we're going to call that the master. And if you refer to that publication from Yale, we're going to call it the AA key. It doesn't matter why it's called AA. Just, uh, just accept it. We're going to call it AA, just the letters A, A. Then we've got the backdoor key. That's just tagged keyed. We're going to call that 1AA. And that will mean it's the first key under the AA system. AA is the master, that's the system. 1AA is the first change key in the AA system. I don't want to get too definition heavy. Go with it. Master's called AA. Backdoor is called 1AA. Just leave it at that. Now, these, both of these keys have cuts on them. Those cuts that you can see on the keys are directly related to how we're going to go about pinning them in terms of not how we're going to pin them, but which and what pins we're going to use to physically pin the chamber of the cylinders so that we can create those cylinders such that these keys pass them or work them or operate them. Okay, You can see that the key on the top, the first cut, and on the conventional key systems like we're doing here, it's the first chamber is defined as the first chamber from the bow, not the tip. This is not how all key systems are, but this is how this one is. Bow to tip. First chamber, you can see that there's a cut here. On the other key, which is the master key, you might be able to see that that first chamber cut is far deeper. You can look at your key in your pocket right now and notice that there are cuts on them, and some are deeper than others. Well, those cuts, the depth of those cuts, is a mathematical number. It's just a value. It's a value between 0 and 9. Okay, but what we have to do is define what we have to determine what those values are. Uh, one way that I, I do it would be to use a key gauge. On my desk, I have the, my tools laid out in front of me, so at this point, I'm going to rotate the camera down and work from the desktop uh, from this point forward. So on my desktop, I have a ProLock blue punch machine. This is just a key cutter, it's a tool used by locksmiths to punch keys. I'm only using this because, uh, well, first of all, I'm using it as an example because I love the ProLock tool. It's a fantastic tool. These, this, you can get decades of service out of these if you treat them nice. They're great tools. They're expensive, but they're fan they're indispensable. <laughs> ProLock company. Um, it has a a key gauge in the front of it. You can see that there's a zero over here, and you might not be able to see it, but there's a nine over here. 
So what you basically do to gauge the key is slide it in the key gauge. So you would physically slide that in the first chamber until it stops. And then this key, yeah, my handle's in the way there, but it stops at a four. It stops at a four. And you do that for all the cuts on the key. And you do that for all the cuts on the other key as well, or for whatever keys you're doing. That will determine the cuts on the key. So at this point, I'm going to put the tool down on the desk, and I'm literally going to gauge these keys, and I will call them out right now. And I've got a piece of paper here that I'm going to write the numbers down on. And I'm going to do the master first, which again, we're going to call the AA key. And the first cut on the AA key is a 4, and the second cut is a 5. I'll do them two at a time because it's not asking too much to remember two at a time. The third cut is a 1. The fourth cut is a 1. So I've got a 1, 1. The fifth cut is a 5. Is that right? Yes, it is. 4, 5, 1, 1, 5. Those are the cuts on the master key, or the AA key. Now I'm going to do what we're going to call the change key, which we're also calling 1AA, which again is the back door of this building. The first cut is a 9. The second cut is a 7. I'm writing the numbers down. The third cut is a 6. The fourth cut is a 3. The fifth cut is a three as well. That's what the is. Nine, seven, six, three, three are the cuts on the key of the chain of the change key. So the cuts on this key are nine, seven, six, three, three. You can see that the 9 is deeper than the 7, and the 7 is deeper than the 3 and the 3. So you get an idea of what I'm talking about at this point. This is a, this is a, and I'm going to put the uh, key gauge or the blue punch away now. I won't need that anymore. And this is a very generic style system. Uh, interchangeable core uh, is different in terms of how you key them, but the fundamental principle is still the same of numbers like this and how they relate to each other. Uh, in, in conventional sort of keying, you know, uh, pin tumbler sort of keying, I think is, uh, in my experience, this the construct of what we're talking about is, is fairly universal. Um, okay, now, I'd like to discuss the differences between uh, the two sorts of pins that will need to be used to pin this. So I'm introducing now an idea of the pins out of the key, uh, the pin kit here. I have my pin kit, this is my personal kit, Okay, this has been with me for 15 years. This is a lab. I think they call it an emerald wedge. I like the three thousandths increment kit. I won't define that. It's just, you know, um, this is the tool that I like to use, the pin kit I like to use, the three thousandths version. Lots of pins in here. And I'm not going to go into a definition of of the kit it's outside of this conversation but let's talk about the two pins so you can see that it, let's just talk about the first chamber the first chamber has a four and a nine okay let's talk about the two different pins the first pin is called a bottom pin the bottom pin when you're pinning a chamber is always the smaller of the two numbers the smaller of the two numbers between four and nine is obviously a four I'm going to take a 4 out of my kit and that, as a bottom pin, and now I'm going to show it to you. I've got tweezers here that I'm using because the pin is too small to show. You can see on the bottom of that pin that it is pointed. The top has a very, very slight bevel to it, but the top is basically flat. The important part is the bottom has a point to it. The point on the bottom is, by no coincidence, directly related to that it mates well with the cut in the key. The angle of that pin is specifically designed to be fairly universal and work with a lot of different cylinders. And that works real well. And that's, that is exactly the, 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 the reason that the bottom pin goes first, because it has to fit into the key like this. Okay. 
The other type of pin is called the master pin. Okay. The master pin we would use in the first chamber between the 4 and 9. We've already got a 4 for the bottom pin. How do we get to a 9? Well, we add a 5. It's just that simple. You add a 5 master pin. So I'm going to reach into my kit and pull out a 5 master pin, put it in the tweezers and show it to you. The 5 master pin is just squared off top and bottom. There's no point to it. It's just squared off. The thickness of the pin is directly related to the number. A five master pin is going to be thicker than a two master pin. And a nine master pin, which you would never use, let's, let's back up. A seven master pin would, would be thicker than the, which would, uh, a seven master pin would obviously be thicker than a five master pin because just think of it this way, the number is bigger, okay? Those two pins are what we're going to need to start pinning this, this cylinder. Now, we're going to do these one chamber at a time. Your master key has got a four cut. Your change key has got a nine cut. I'm going to take the cylinder of my first lock, which is the deadbolt, which I've already partially disassembled. I'm going to insert the master key, which is the AA key into the cylinder and then I'm going to drop my four bottom pin and what I'm looking at here and it's going to be hard for you to see on the camera I'm looking to see that that pin is flush with the top of the cylinder plug this is called the cylinder plug this slides into the cylinder housing I have the plug removed using a tool called a plug follower which is just a locksmithing tool used for this purpose and based on my experience, I'm looking, so, I'm looking for that pin to be very flush. Flu the condition of flush is what must be created in order for a key to work properly. Okay? We do it this way, take a pin and load it into the chamber and make sure that it's flush so that when we load all of the pins into the housing, we're very confident that the key is going to actually work. Now the four that I had there, I didn't like. It was a little bit too low, so I've gone up to the next largest pin, which would be three thousandths of an inch bigger, because I'm using a three thousandths of an inch kit. And I'm fairly confident that based on my experience, I'm looking at that, and those that pin is going to be flush and will work once I get it all stacked and loaded and then put back into the lock. Now we've got to go to the number nine in the first chamber because we already have uh, a four and that would of course be a five master pin. I've already got a five master pin pulled and I'm going to put the five master pin in there. Now keep in mind we've got a four bottom pin in there. It's a three thousandths of an inch heavy so our five might be a little heavy. I've inserted the other key that's going to require a nine cut and based on my experience I'm looking at it and that's going to work real it's going to work real nice once it's loaded. Yeah, we're going to leave it just like that. So, these two pins that we have at this point, the four bottom pin and the five master pin look real good. Now, I'm going to take those two pins and I'm just going to stack them on my desktop, on my on my on my workspace. And I'm going to leave them there, right here. Okay, I'm actually going to move them out of the way so I don't knock them over. Now we're going to go on to the second chamber. Second chamber is five and seven. So we're going to load a, we're going to install, uh, insert the five master key into the cylinder plug. We're going to grab a five bottom pin. We're going to drop it into the cylinder. And we're going to make sure that the pin is flush with the with the uh, top with the cylinder plug, so that we know we've got a real good condition of it being flush. Yes, so we've got a five master pin drop there. I'm looking at the pin based on my experience. That's very flush with the top of the cylinder. I know that's hard to see, and that looks real good. Then the, uh, now we've got to get to a 7, 
because we've got a five in the second chamber already loaded. Now we got to get to a seven. That's a two master pin. It's just that simple. We're going to swap the keys out to the deeper key, the key that's got the seven cut, which is the change key. And we're going to grab ourselves that two master, pop it into the cylinder, then make sure that it looks like it's flush with the top of the cylinder. And again, I, I do know it's difficult for you to see there. But based on my experience, that's going to work out real well. It looks real flush. I'm going to take these pins out. I'm going to stack them on the desktop. We're going to move on to the third chamber. Third chamber has a one and a six. The master's got the one in it, so we're going to insert the master. We're going to grab a number one pin, a key. Uh, pardon me, a number one bottom pin. You know what? We're going to kind of cheat a little bit. I think we're going to do chambers three and four at the same time. Chambers three and four have a one uh, for both of them, so we're going to load a number one bottom pin in chambers three. Now we're not cheating; we're just trying to move a little bit faster. Uh, a one in the third chamber and a one in the fourth chamber, and looking at both of those, my experience tells me that the pins are going to be very flush, which is what we want. Okay, those, those look very good. They're both very flush. We're going to remove this key. We're going to insert the change key because it's got a six and a three for chambers three and four. We're going to then load the commiserate uh, master pins. Third chamber requires a five. Fourth chamber requires a two. So we're going to load a five master pin into the third chamber. And we're going to load a two master pin in the fourth chamber. Oops, fell out on me. And looking at these, based on my experience, those pins are very flush with the top. I know it's hard to see on the camera. Those pins are flush on the top, and we're good to go. I'm going to take these out one chamber at a time, stack them on my desk. and move on to the fifth chamber. Fifth chamber, it's different than the rest in that the bottom pin, the three, is on the change key. You can see that the lower number is on the AA key or the master key on all the others, but it doesn't really matter for this example. You've got your change key inserted, you're going to drop a number three bottom pin. Let's do that now. Got a three bottom pin out of out, out of my kit, dropping it into the chamber, reviewing it. Looks really good. And now we're going to drop a two master pin. From three to five is two. I'll drop that pin in. Make sure uh, after switching the key, of course. Make sure that that condition is going to be flush and it. wasn't a two I put in. Let's put in a two. Okay, based on my experience that two master pin comes up to five real well. Now at this point I'm going to leave those in the in the chamber and I'm going to remove my key. I've got my fifth chamber already loaded with pins. I'm going to go back to my desk and I'm going to grab all of the bottom pins because I put them on the desk in a very organized fashion so I knew which was the first chamber and which was the fourth chamber on my desk. And I've got all my bottom pins loaded. Now I'm going to go back and load all my top pins. And, it, and once I get them all loaded, the keys are either going to work or they're not going to work. And only experience will make it such that you're, you, you're going to be confident whether or not to do this because if the key does not work, based on my, my experience of looking at the cylinder, knowing whether or not it's going to be flush, that just comes with time. So I've inserted the cylinder back in. My one AA key works really nice. Okay. My master key works really doesn't work as nice. But it does work. And in this instance, what we end up doing oh yeah, that's it. It just had a little burr on it and it works really good at this point. 
Yeah. So my experience has taught me over years of doing this how to go about making this job easy. You want the key to be really, really smooth in its operation. The example that I've kind of given people tongue in cheek, you don't want people to come home, let's say after a night of celebrating their birthday, and maybe they've enjoyed their evening a lot. You don't want them to have to struggle with getting in. You want their you want their key to work really nice and smooth. That's the hallmark of of, of somebody who takes pride in keying their cylinder. If someone can come home and that key just works like butter the first time, that's what that's really what you're uh, uh, achieve, trying to achieve. The way you achieve that is by pinning it properly, using the proper size pins. Experience tells me when the pin is going to work and not going to work, even on such a fine, a small amount of of um, tolerance as I was using in the pins there. Real happy with how that works. Now, I said that I was going to key the other cylinder in succession right after this one. The bottom line is the process is identical. I'm, I'm not going to spend seven more minutes explaining that, making, uh, making you watch me go through those steps. It's identical. The process is identical. You gauge the keys, you load the bottom pins, you then load the top pins, your experience will tell you whether or not it works, and that's it. Now, this video is not intended to be viewed necessarily by people who are locksmiths. These people who make a living in locksmithing know this uh, better than I. This video is really intended uh, to be viewed by those people who are just curious or want to know how the process works. How does the magic of, of locksmithing actually work? And it is magic, and the people who make a living do it um, are an irreplaceable segment of uh, the door hardware uh, industry um, that, um, in, in my opinion, um, you know, have skills that cannot be replaced by anybody else, really. Uh, the simple keying that we've done here is... Uh, I'm even reserved to even call it locksmithing in the sense that a locksmith does so much more than just simple house king, although this is you know, probably the bulk of the kind of work that's done. So, refer to the link up above to the Yale publication if you're interested. And again, this video is for the curiosity, curiosity of people who want to have an idea of how it works. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I've explained this. I've shown people this kind of stuff, you know, probably hundreds of times and everybody feels a certain amount of edification as a result of knowing how it works. Uh, it's one of those things, you know, you know how, how are the northern lights? Uh, how are, why are those created? Well, once you know, it's, it's good knowledge to know, but you don't become a scientist. Um, also, on this page or on our website, by the time you're viewing this, it could have been moved, is also a video called Why Hiring a Locksmith is the Best Idea. <laughs> And this video really goes hand in hand with that other existing video because I go on to talk about um, the, the, the fact of why hiring a locksmith to do this kind of work is really the best idea. Whether you're a homeowner or whether you're an engineer who is responsible for a large hospital campus. Um, you know, locksmiths, again, are indispensable. However, this video is to serve as a bit amount of, uh, you know, pulling the... Uh, curtain back against away from of how this material is done. If you do have questions on, on Master Keying, uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, obviously, uh, inclusion of this video in the website is to let you know that the lock sets that you buy from us, we can provide all of these services to fit your needs uh, with a variety of different manufacturers, a variety of their individual keyways, and, and quite frankly, keyed exactly how you would like, because the concept of keying is uh, capable of handling every aspect, whether it's a home or it's a facility as large as, um, you know, the Empire State Building. You know, everything in between can be handled with keying. The publication from Yale goes, a, in my opinion, does all of the work in describing how that can be uh, created. My name is Rich Howard, owner of Architectural Builder Supply. Uh, any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you for watching this long-winded video. Bye-bye.